It's yours, Charlie. Uh, for our next talk, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Vaishnavi. Uh, please tell us about your living history. Uh, thank you so much, Sri, for having me here today. It's quite intimidating to go after all those amazing, awe inspiring talks. Um, I'm Vaishnavi Anantanaranan. I'm an Embel Australia group leader at the Single Molecule Science Node at UNSW Sydney. Um, let me start at the very beginning. I grew up in this coastal town, a former French colony called Pondicherry, which is now known as Puducherry. I had a pretty happy childhood. I was a happy child. This is my mother here. That's my father, my sister in the corner here. And um, this is <laughs> the picture I, they took before my first day of school. I hated school. I absolutely hated school. But I really loved learning. I loved learning new things. I loved all my subjects equally. Um, and I think what really helped was I had amazingly supportive parents and my sister. Um, they did not hold back in their encouragement for me to do whatever I wanted to. And uh, that is how I ended up doing my undergrad, which combined biology and computer science. Um, initially, on my father was hoping I'd get into medical school. I'm so glad I didn't. I almost made it, but it's super competitive to get into medical schools in India. And I missed out by a few marks, but I'm super happy I eventually didn't get into medical school. Um, I almost went to NU Singapore for my undergrad. I was admitted to a program that let me do a four-year BSc honors in science. But then I had to, if I took on that opportunity, I'd have to stay in Singapore for an additional six years to, to work through a bond. And that wasn't the most appealing at that point in time. And oh, so I ended up going to... Sorry, sorry, a box appeared on your slide, but it's gone now. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so... Yes, yeah, so I went ahead and then uh, joined uh, this engineering college called Bits Pilani uh, at their Goa campus. Goa is another nice coastal town, which was a former Portuguese colony. But I started an integrated uh, MSc in biological sciences, which was a five-year degree right after my grade 12. Um, in my second year, I had the opportunity of taking on an additional engineering degree, and I took computer science as the option. Initially, I didn't know if I wanted to do it, but I went ahead. This meant an additional year of my master's and bachelor's combined. But uh, I think I'm, I'm super glad I ended up taking this because this degree has really helped me um, open my eyes to new ways of looking at questions. Um, and I ended up graduating with a MSc in biological sciences and MB in computer science in 2009. Um, but I'd like to highlight three internships that I undertook during my undergraduate years all of which were in Bangalore, which um, is the place that Vasanthi was alluding to earlier as well in her talk. So I first went to the Indian Institute of Science in 2007 for a two month internship in the lab of uh, Utpal Nath uh, to work on a, uh, characterizing a gene that is involved in leaf shape determination. Um, and then I went to the lab of late uh, Professor Veronica Rodriguez in NCBS also in Bangalore to look at the role of activity in the maintenance of larval olfactory receptor neurons in 2008 for a six month period. And finally, again, for a six month internship, I went to Microsoft Research India to explore the computer science aspect of things by building a programming language for expressing and automating biology protocols with uh, Dr. William Peace. And as you can probably tell from all the different topics that I was working on, I really didn't have a preference for one um, area of biology versus the other. All of them are equally interesting to me. And so there was a bit of confusion in what I was going to study for my PhD. Uh, what I did uh, narrow it down to was cell and molecular biology was what I thought I wanted to do. Um, and of course, what was also cemented to me was the fact that I wanted to do a PhD. So I went ahead and started applying to, to do my PhD in the US in 2009, just after the econ economy had collapsed in 2008. And I'd applied to a few different schools and I got a couple of offers, but without funding. And that was something I couldn't do at that point in time. So I did ended up not accepting those offers. I'm actually sorry to interrupt. There's a yeah. box in the lower part of your screen. I don't know. I can't can... see it. Sorry. Oh, it disappeared now. All right. Oh, that's weird. Sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so um, finally I ended up uh, going back to William T's, uh, William T's lab at the Microsoft Research India, continuing on to work on the programming language and published it. But then I had my, um, I, I was through with applying to the US. I ended up looking at places in Europe to go to for a PhD also because there were shorter PhDs. 
Um, and I applied to a few different places, but I only got two interview calls, one of which turned out to be at NTICBG in Dresden, which turned out to be the most amazing experience of my life. Um, I was extremely lucky to be paired with Eva Tolich to study the regulation of motor proteins, specifically that of cytoplasmic dynein in living cells. And this is a fission yeast cell. So uh, before I landed in Eva's lab, I had not touched a microscope. Uh, I had oh, I had never even looked at, um, uh, sorry, can you still see my slides? Uh, yes, we can. Yes, sorry, uh, yes, sorry Vaishnavi, uh, the box, it yes. goes away whenever your cursor is at the bottom of your screen. So if oh. you can put your cursor at the bottom of your screen, I think we are good. Okay, cool, sorry, sorry about this, yeah. Um, um, in any case, uh, when I went to Eva's lab, I had never really used a microscope. And the first day that I landed in the lab, a graduate student accompanied me down to the turf microscope that was available at uh, CBG. And uh, I looked at single molecules of dynenes floating around in the cytoplasm of um, vision yeast cells, and I was transfixed. I think this was the most transformative aspect uh, in, event in my um, science career because I think then is where I realized what I really wanted to do, which was look at cytoskeleton and motor proteins in living cells in real time. And I couldn't have asked for a better advisor. Eva has been the most supportive supervisor, mentor, uh, uh, friend all through the years. So this was right after my thesis defense in 2014. And I, of course, keep bumping into Eva in conferences. In fact, I planned to bump into her. Um, this was in Roscoff in 2017 and later on in Heidelberg in 2022. Um, just recently. Um, but after having finished my PhD, which was a successful PhD, I still didn't quite know what I wanted to do. Um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to remain in academia. Um, and I had to come back to India for personal reasons. I, I was going to get married and I couldn't at that point in time go to a different country. Um, and I was trying out different options. Um, but I have fantastic mentors all through my academic career. And a couple of them I'd like to highlight here are Nenad Pavan and Joe Howard, who were part of my thesis advisory committee as well, encouraged me to re remain in academia, and we had frequent calls discussing how I'd go about it. Um, but I, at the same time, also tried my luck in um, industry and failed pretty spectacularly. But what I did manage to uh, get is this Inspire Faculty Award, which is available to Indian PhD graduates, freshly uh, minted PhDs, in fact. Who, um, they, who are given the ability to start their own independent groups with a little bit of uh, research money as well as support for their salaries. I was awarded this in 2014 in January and I was able to start my research group at the Indian Institute of Science not long after in June 2014 at the Center for Biosystem Science and Engineering. Um, and uh, needless to say, going right from a PhD to starting an independent group was quite tough. I didn't know what I had gotten myself into, but it was fun because um, I think I learned the ropes really quickly. I had, again, fantastic mentors uh, who helped me traverse academia. Two of them I'd like to mention here are Sandhya Vishweshwaraya at ISC and Ella Shashidara, who is now at NCBS Bangalore. Uh, I think Sandhya has been a constant source of support and encouragement throughout my time at ISC and beyond. And Shashi actually was the first person to reach out to me when I went back to India after finishing my PhD. He, in fact, had seen my paper and invited me to come and give a talk at the uh, Institute in Pune, where he was then head of the Biological Sciences Division. And he's continued to sponsor me in ways that I hadn't really uh, anticipated, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, we started looking at a few different projects in my lab at Vision uh, in, in ISC. We initially, I initially thought I was going to work primarily with mammalian cells, but at the time that I started my lab, there was really nothing there. There's no infrastructure, so we had to set up stuff from scratch. The cell culture facilities were taking time to be set up, so I went back to fission yeast, which I'd used as a model to study a few different things. Um, we looked at microtubule, mitochondria interactions, and I collaborated with others in the department to look at pro other projects so that I could keep stuff coming out from the lab. Uh, and we had a fruitful time. Uh, this was the lab in 2017. And one thing which was some, uh, which I became acutely aware of uh, it was of misogyny and biases of the workplace. As a grad student in Eva's lab, I had really never even thought about these things. But having started my lab at the Indian Institute of Science, I think this was something that was confronting me on a daily basis. And I'll talk about this in just a bit again. 
But after three fruitful years as an independent group leader, I applied for and successfully acquired the position of assistant professor at the same department at the same institute. Um, the science was going on really, really well. We were starting to look at how you can get predictability from stochasticity relating to the cytoskeleton and organization within cells. But I was still quite unhappy with the treatment of women and minorities in, in academia. This was the lab in 2020, so we had quite a few different people working with us. It was a fun lab. Um, but like I mentioned, the treatment of women and minorities in academia was really bugging me. And in 2020, I partnered with uh, Dr. Shruti Murlidhar, who is now in Deep Genomics Canada, to found uh, Bias Watch India, which is a platform where we use to document the proportion of women in Indian academia and also highlight the lack of women representation in Indian scientific conferences. Um, I urge you to take a look at our Twitter page as well as our website to get more information about what we do. But this was one way in which we are hoping to fight biases in Indian academia by showing um, the reality of how few women we have in Indian academia. Um, like I mentioned, because of the constant and daily uh, microaggressions I had to face at work, I felt I was not being uh, able to focus uh, quite as much on, on my science as I could. And so I applied to and was admitted to the Embel Australia cohort as a group leader at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, and at the time that I had applied, the late Professor Katrina Gauss was the head of the single molecule science node where I am based currently. And she continues to be a really strong role model for me. Um, unfortunately, she passed away uh, a couple of years ago now and I miss her quite a bit. But here in my lab, we're focusing on looking at how stochasticity translates to predictability in living systems. I have a slide right uh, in the next, next, the next slides about our, uh, about our research and I'll show that to you in just a bit. But this was a lab in 2020. We've built another fun set of people that are very interested in looking at anything to do with the cytoskeleton. Um, I'm gonna show you a snapshot of all of the stuff that we do in the lab. I'm not gonna talk about any of these, but I'm very excited to partner with anybody in the audience that is excited by any of these questions. Um, what I would like to talk about, take a minute or so to talk about is inclusion in academia because it's something I feel very strongly about. Um, I think with my experience working in India, working in Germany and working now in Australia, one thing that is immediately apparent is that there is, of course, differences in way in the way that equity, diversity, and inclusion are addressed in different continents and countries. Um, I think at this point in India, there is still denial about the state of um, representation of women and minorities in science, and that's what we're hoping to counter with with real data with Bias Watch India. I think the dif the difference in Australia is that there is a recognition of the issue surrounding EDI. What continues to remain uh, ignored is the question of inclusion in academia. Um, and to give you a really quick example, equity and diversity are measurable quantities. You could, for instance, um, have equitable representation of different communities, for instance, in a grant, um, grant uh, application. You could look at number of applications from a specific proportion of uh, communities and see what proportion of the finally selected candidates come from that particular community and, and see if it was equitable. Similarly, diversity is measurable. You can look at the number of people, number of different communities that are represented in your institute, for instance. Um, there's still quite a way to go in all of the countries uh, that, are, that are addressing EDI at this point in time, but it is at the point of being addressed. But what is often ignored is inclusion. And inclusion by definition is not measurable. It is the feeling of belonging, a feeling of being able to be your authentic self and being accepted at the same time at work. And I think this is something that leads to imposter syndrome for a lot of minorities and women in science. Uh, this is true for me as well. I, I have terrible imposter syndrome, but I think this is a construct. And, and this is because we're, uh, scientists from diverse backgrounds are higher, they're brilliant, they do amazing science, but I don't think institutes and labs are doing enough to support support them. And I think for us um, to as a community, what we need to do is uh, better address inclusion and make sure that we are taking steps to in address inclusion and taking away biases that extend to every facet of science. Um, I will uh, have a couple of acknowledgement slides I think I wouldn't be where I am now without all the people that have contributed to the lab. 
Um, this is with ISE in Bangalore in the first row and at UNSW in the second row. And these amazing people have um, made possible everything that we've achieved in the lab. Um, I mentioned a few of my mentors over the years. I, I haven't mentioned a few, a few others. Um, thank you so much to my peers, mentors as well, and friends in academia. You know who you are. I write and speak to you almost on a monthly basis. Funding, of course, without which nothing would have been possible. And I'd be remiss if I did not um, thank my partner of 10 years now, Sumit Yamdagni, uh, and our cats, Minnie, Mouse, and Liki Lee, who make life better. Uh, Sumit has been with me through everything, and he's my strongest supporter. I will stop there and take any questions if there are any. Great. Thank you for a fantastic talk, Vaishnavi, and uh, I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. Um, so um, I wanted to ask a question about um, I mean, the discussion around inclusion in academia, and you were highlighting the differences between diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, in terms of, in terms of moving this forward um, with respect to helping other people understand inclusion is different, how, how do you uh, go about that? Um, I think one of the first things that people need to do is educate themselves about what the state of affairs is at, at uh, different institutes. There's quite a few uh, research papers, there's uh, opinion pieces, all of which can, can be starting places for people to inform themselves about the state of affairs uh, at this point in time. Um, I think that's something any of us and all of us can do. There are different things that people with different amounts of power are able to. Uh, and, and again, there, there are several resources out there. Uh, if you are, for instance, a graduate student, if you're a postdoc versus a group leader versus an institute head, there's so many different, at so many different levels that you can start um, practicing inclusion in your workspace. And I'm happy to send resources to anybody that is interested, but there's several resources out there already. Um, and I'm hoping that everybody can contribute. Great, thank you very much.